Hello and welcome back to Watching Grief for the week of the 20th of February 2023. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman of the House Brockman. Uh, how are you doing uh, Andrew? <laughs> Sir Andrew? Uh, well I'm, I'm delighted to tell you I, I wasn't shot to death with a crossbow while sitting on the loo this morning so uh Hey. In that respect, things things are going pretty well. That's a win. That's a win. You know, never That's mind. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take <laughs> yeah, it. <laughs> never mind if supermarkets are, are, are currently struggling to get cucumbers. You were not shot by a crossbow. Well done. Uh, Actually, the, just 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 before we start, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but our um, our, our esteemed um, environment secretary, Therese Coffee, went full baldry this morning uh -huh. and said basically that um and then this and for uh our viewer who's not in 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 england at the moment um various supermarkets are rationing salad goods for reasons which are um controversial in that some people say it's to do with uh the the weather in morocco and spain and others say it's to do with the b word yeah but anyway uh we're being we're being rationed as as to the salad that we're allowed to buy and Therese coffee this morning said that if you can't buy tomatoes you can eat turnips so i'm really looking forward to tucking into a turnip bolognese tonight oh nice tur nice turnip oh yeah um or a turnip of my very own <laughs> um wow okay well regardless of whether or not we're going to be tucking into turnip bolognese or indeed whether you survived a, a, an assassination attempt this week um <laughs> <laughs> Our watching brief continues. There are some who would like to, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, our watching brief continues. And it is uh, yet again one where we have uh, missed a week, actually. We hopped over last week. And this isn't because this is becoming a pattern. Rather, it's because we keep on getting stories that, that are so tantalizingly close to being talk aboutable and publishable in that week that we hold on we hold on we hold on and then you're oh, the weekend comes so in this instance last week we we were fairly certain we were going to be talking about a case of illegal burial that you were saying last friday uh that your jaw just kept on hitting the floor over and over again it just uh, i just i had this vision of people having to sort of you know what's the the looney tunes kind of like a roll uh, a, a blind to sort of you know wind you back up again um it was a heck it seems to have been on the surface an interesting headline that 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 we're waiting on some comments aren't we just to just just so we can we can talk about it and it's many yes fantastical layers in with uh with accuracy and uh responsibility next week um but what i mean do any 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 um any uh, tidbits? Any uh, teasers for people? Um, put it this way: I think um, we're looking at the episode of Father Ted and the Vicar of Dibley that was <laughs> the, the mashup that was never made. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You let Dougal do a funeral. You. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say no more. Say no more. Say no more. Say no more. No. More. No, no. Yeah. So it's it's going to be <clears> worth it. Uh, but this week, given that that's going to be hilarious and interesting, we're hoping to make this week's topic interesting uh, by bringing to you what has finally, you know, we can we can say what has finally been published in terms of the government's plans for uh, the definition of treasure. And uh, I suppose a key question since the treasure act i think it's called was introduced mm -hmm. in the late 90s 96 i think you were saying uh yeah p people have been discussing and debating and 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 arguing and using and misusing arguably uh the definition of treasure in this country for various ways and means and mm -hmm. i suppose that the the key question or the first question is why why did why have we been waiting on this because it feels as though you and i have been watching successive um administrations if not governments in this country to sort of shelve this this issue over and over again uh so what why has a, a definition change been required and i suppose why has it taken so long to get to where we've got to because we'll we'll get to the quality of it in a moment but you, you just want to do a little bit of groundwork though 
Okay, a little bit of background. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's sort of necessary background because um, this is a moment where modern practice in archaeology and society mm -hmm. comes up against the oldest um, traditions and case law in what's called the common law and the, the development of uh, the, the, the law, in certainly in England and Wales. Mm. Um what happened what, what what we're dealing with is uh an amendment to the treasure act 1996 it was one of the last acts of parliament brought in by the major government before the labor landslide victory in 1997 right and it was also one of the most significant pieces of legislation relating to archaeology that there's ever been in this country because what it did was modernize the ancient law of treasure trove which dates right back to uh roman civil law mm -hmm. Um, now, treasure trove uh, is a concept. I mean, there was um, when I was prepping for this, I found a quote from a, a Roman jurist called Paulus, uh, and in translation, he described um, the uh, treasure, mm -hmm. um, or in, in, uh, intriguingly, thesaurus, as it's called in Latin. Uh, that, uh, people might be familiar with the term in another context in terms of uh, a thesaurus of language. Yeah. It's actually a, treasure, a treasury of language, in fact. Mm. But um, uh, Paulus, uh, as I say, was a Roman jurist and described treasure trove as, quote, an ancient deposit of money for which no memory exists so that there is no present owner. Right. And the laws of treasure trove were designed to work out how do you deal with this when somebody, you know, somebody's plowing their field and up pops an urn full of gold coins yeah that yeah. they haven't buried who who, and, who has ti who has title to that to that to that treasure to that, that to that money yeah to and that financial and, value yeah and, and and it's worth you know that this question of, of how you deal with that equitably is, is seemingly universal but i just want to just take a moment there because i yeah i didn't realize that you'd done that that amount of prep um i uh, just to say that's <laughs> that's amazing that's really actually quite cool that that in Roman times, people ha were finding things that they couldn't account for and and that, that had no direct line of ownership, even though it turned up on someone's mm. own land. Uh, this is something that, that, that is at the heart of of of, uh, of the conversations we're about to have. But it's fascinating that this, this is a 2,000-year-old problem, at least. It's, it's, yeah, really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. Well, and, and it goes down, uh, certainly in... in, in what's called the common law in England and Wales. Um, there was a law of um, Edward the Confessor, uh, which also um, laid down stipulations for who owned material that turned up like that. Now, it also, uh, is also has, has been tied up with government. Right. Um, and some of you might, uh, watching this might remember the story that uh, King Richard I uh, of, of, of England um, actually met his end besieging a castle because it was rumoured that the, the lord of that particular castle had found a, a hoard of uh, gold objects, treasure objects, and wasn't handing them over to the king. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 and um, to cut to the chase, um, the... In, in English practice, it came down to laws of finders. It came down to Keep the it. crown's prerogative to no. claim uh, to claim precious objects, and in particular, definitions of whether precious material had been buried with the intention of being recovered or had been lost. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and or, or buried without any intention to recover mm. and in archaeology uh, perhaps the most famous case is the treasure trove inquest into the find at Sutton who mm. where uh, mrs pretty on whose land the artifacts were found was given title to them because they'd been buried without any intent to recover them they were grave goods yeah yeah and under the law as it then stood it was only her you know sense of public duty that had her hand over the artifacts to the british museum she could have flogged them off yeah, oh, yeah. or she um, could have had the most amazing uh amazing 
uh, museum in her house. You know, <laughs> absolutely, ab absolutely, with with, with 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 a with a tea shop selling the most brilliant lemon drizzle cake. Oh yeah, that, that lemon drizzle cake. Yeah, mm, very refreshing. Yeah, uh, pecan. So, um, no, pecan. Yeah, um, ab ab absolutely. <laughs> but but basic basically, the the medieval laws of of, of of treasure trove were wide open to pretty you know unintended accidents of distribution if you like mm -hmm. um if important archaeological material turned up mm -hmm. um this discussion went on for a long time um in archaeology it was heightened by the development of the hobby of metal detecting in the 70s 80s into the early 90s mm -hmm. um so that by 1996 it was recognized that uh the definition of treasure was outdated the idea of treasure trove and whether or not it was buried with intention to recover and so on yeah was uh w w was not fit for purpose in the modern world okay particularly with the amount of material that was coming up through uh so particularly detectorists finds so and, 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 so, uh, you may not you may not it may not be worthwhile going into but what why why was that an issue in so much as is it because the types of finds were changing and therefore uh, these sorts of uh, assertions about intent were getting harder to prove, or was it just to do with a volume, a matter of volume, and therefore actually having to prove some of these things wasn't um, was no longer convenient given the, the sheer amount of material that's now coming out of the ground? I mean, what what do you know what that pressure, why that pressure came to bear to that of interest? Yeah, I mean, there, there were a number of cases in the run up to the 96 Act, which had mm. highlighted the, the potential for accidents, basically, in okay. the way that material was um, was found and and dealt with after finding. Um, so the Sutton Who case is probably the most famous. Um, mm. there, 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 there were others. And with the increasing amount of material that was coming up through metal detective finds, particularly hordes, mm -hmm. um, which yeah, you know, things that could could have you know if if they were you know were able to be studied properly and um, uh, and and that and you know that that should be in a museum, mm -hmm. um, right? You know, it, it it became a it became an issue. Um, there was um, another case in the early seventy, uh, so back in nineteen eighty one, um, when a bronze hoard of Roman coins um, was um, judged to belong to the owner of a field and not and couldn't be held by the British Museum. Um, that that was decided at the uh, Court of Appeal. Right. So you know, by, by by 96, it was it was a pretty apparent that the old law wasn't fit for purpose. The mm -hmm. the important material was not being seen or retained. By the heritage community in the public you know for, as a public good okay um and um so but rather than go down the route of either uh for example banning metal detecting completely as is done in the republic of ireland mm -hmm. um and um at the same time asserting that anything of historical value uh, or of, of, of historical nature found anywhere within the borders of the Republic of Ireland belong to the state. Mm -hmm. um, British practice, English and Welsh practice, uh, retain the rights of ownership of a landowner. Yeah. And it was only artifacts that were defined as treasure under the 96 Act, which are basically essentially um, artifacts containing an element of precious metal of at least 10% and at least 300 years old if it's not a coin. Yeah, or at least two coins in the same find that are at least um, three hundred years old, and um, ten percent of precious metal by weight, or uh, more than ten coins in the same find, which are at least three hundred years old. So that catches the bronze hordes. Okay. Okay. You know, you know. Uh, there are other definitions as well, but ba basically, it um, and, and it, it also. Um, tried to catch prehistoric uh, material as well so for right. example uh, bronze age hordes uh, of you know uh, well known hordes of um, tool, tools tools and, and scrap yeah. yeah that's right mm -hmm. and there's arguments about whether they're um, votive uh, burials or whether they're smiths burying raw materials for later you know 
yeah recovery yeah, or, or whatever or part of the so-called crash yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly trying to so, create scarcity by hiding material yeah 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 <clears throat> so so so, ba so basically the 96 act um it didn't define everything as important it mm -hmm. defined certain artifacts as important it defined certain types of artifacts as important and certain periods of artifacts as important okay and there and therefore subject to regulation um and the mechanism that was put in place to regulate treasure finds um it's called the treasure valuation committee it's based at the british museum um it is an expert body uh that consists of archaeologists curators uh finds experts um uh, but also a, um a um representations from the antiquities trade as an example of how this is supposed to work mm -hmm. uh, i'm out with a metal detector i find for example a um a pot of roman gold coins mm. um i have reason to believe that object is treasure because it looks as though it's sort of gold and shiny so i've then got 14 days starting from the day after i make the find to report it to a coroner and not doing that is, is an offense i can be up in front of a a court for for not declaring okay um and the coroner then notifies the british museum um uh, or the national museum of wales depending whether you're in england or wales mm -hmm. uh and basically there's 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 an inquest um the british museum has a, a an organization called the treasure valuation committee and that writes expert reports about those finds uh, which they submit to the coroner they take expert advice from curators fine specialists um finds liaison officers of the portable antiquities scheme who are often actually the first point of contact rather than the coroner no okay um and um then the um an assessment's made whether to disclaim a treasure find which means it goes back to the finder and that can then be disposed of by the finder with the agreement of the landowner because mm -hmm. again the landowner and the finder aren't necessarily the same person and if there's a if there is a separate landowner to find a, there's a 50 50 split on any um any financial settlement okay um but if the find isn't disclaimed if it's kept um to be um you know placed in a, in a museum say um then the finder is given a uh, a financial award a reward for the um the, the 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 value of the object or objects in the case of our hypothetical roman hoard of gold coins mm -hmm. okay. and that can be from a few hundred pounds up to over a million uh, or more as we've seen in some of the high profile cases mm -hmm. um and that is you know that, that that's the system as it's been for the last uh 25 years mm. the problem with that comes when archaeologically important items are found that don't have a content have a precious metal content mm and aren't prehistoric so for example uh people might be familiar with two cases where which highlighted this particular problem with the 96 act one is the crosby garrett roman helmet which is a roman cavalry helmet which turned up in the lake district um and was in the end was sold privately because it couldn't be retained by a museum it's been seen in public a couple of times uh, since it was sold at auction but um it's not currently on public view yeah and another case was the uh, more recent uh, case of the Rydale hoard of um, what are believed to be Roman sacred objects. Yeah. Uh, again, no precious metal content. They're, they're um, copper alloy uh, yeah. and in uh, enamel decoration and so on. Mm. Um, again, it's a fabulous collection. But again, um, they were that was uh, um, allowed to go to auction. Um, and in fact, it was. Um, then subsequently um uh, a a donation was made uh to compensate the buyer uh for the financial value of buying the hoard and uh i think the um museum of yorkshire in york um is is, is uh was was gifted them they put they've been put on they're, or they're going to be or they are put on, on, on display there but that that only happened through the benevolence of a philanthropist yeah, uh, yeah. There was the, the you know the the finan there wasn't a financial mechanism to retain it in public view uh, to mm -hmm. retain the Rydale hoard 
in public. Uh, so, on behalf of the public. <clears throat> so the original treasure trove based law had been all about the intent of the burier or the fate of the material that was buried, in some way talking about ownership as a, a matter of claim. Uh, yeah. The updated version in ninety six focused in on, understandably focused in on precious metal content as it pertained to treasure value as opposed to the intent of the burial or how that material got in the ground. It was about what what is it and what's it made out of. And yeah. then uh, land ownership and et cetera came in, into it uh, as, uh, after that, that that assessment had been made. Um, so is there has there been a move to to add more of the more of a, a, a an intent or qualitative nuance them back into the notion of treasure exactly and that that's where the pressure for the new amendment has come from mm. that um, i mean for example in 2021 a a, um, a pre-roman iron age harness mount was spotted in an auction catalogue uh, of hansen's auctioneers up in derbyshire um people might remember the case i think we talked about it at the time on watching brief and i certainly wrote about it in in, in pipeline mm -hmm. um that artifact was uh regionally if not nationally significant it was spotted by curator at the british museum um it hadn't been reported to the portable antiquity scheme before it had been sent to the auctioneer right um and in fact um that that um there was an intervention that it was um recorded by the PAS, but it was also sold at auction. Mm. Um, and so it, it was incredibly messy. Um, so cases like that led to pressure from archaeological bodies and archaeologists to tighten up the definition so that we moved away from a an idea of either financial value or precious metal to one of archaeological and historical significance okay a and that's what the new amendment is all about hmm. who are the major players in this because i because well not i not i presume i know fine well but I'm, I'm sort of also acting as a bit of a guide for our viewer um hmm. in this instance um who are the major players in terms of i suppose the stakeholders in terms of hmm. what the treasure act means i.e. why has it taken a while a fair while uh to come back to again and again this this definition and eventually publish uh, not so much a change to law but a modification of the existing treasure act okay um as things stand in 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 2023 mm. the principal players in this are obviously the government because the government frames the legislation and you know, when it comes to things like the Portable Antiquities Scheme and uh, Historic England, ultimately, it puts up the money. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, and, and all of this has a cost mm. in terms of people's time, expertise, report writing, coroner's time, court mm. time, all of that, mm. right? So, the, 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 the government is the ultimate arbiter. Mm. Um, beneath that, are the government's statutory advisors, which for England is historic England and for Wales is Cadu. Yes. Yeah. Um, also involved in the British Museum, mm -hmm. who run the treasure process um, in uh, in England and Wales. Mm -hmm. And have been advising, for example, um, people might remember, we talked about the advice that they gave to the government of Jersey mm. uh, over yes. the Cottingham Hoard in, in, in Jersey yeah. um, just over a year ago. Yeah. Um, and then acting in a an advisory stroke consultative role when they're consulted are organisations like CIFA, Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. Um, the um, on 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 the one side, but also metal detecting representative groups like the National Council for Metal Detecting and the Federation of Independent Detectorists and various other. That you know, there's an alphabet soup of of bodies on both sides of the argument who, make, who can make contributions, as well as individual archaeologists. Um, the and, um, well, and, and just to be clear, when you say both sides of the argument, if we're talking about stakeholders, the the, the hmm. central. Uh, the locus of of agreement or disagreement basically resolve, revolves around 
uh, rights and ownership, doesn't it? Correct. So, so, so yes. So uh, an extreme uh, example would be it's mine. I found it. I can do what I want with it. You know, and, yeah. and it's the extent to which that is true that's being discussed and being uh, advised about and being debated and so on and so forth. That's right. And mm. arguably, the new amendment, which I'll come to the details in a moment, arguably the new amendment is a slight restriction on the rights of detectorists. Mm. Mm. Uh, as as seen in contrast to the previous iteration of the act prior to the amendment yeah okay basically the amendment came about um because of a consultation that took place in the period after 2019 mm -hmm. um it's taken uh what three years three and a half years to yeah. get to the stage where the amendment was published this week the way this has been done it's actually it's a very smart piece of um uh parliamentary strategy on the part of the department of culture media and sport mm, and mm. and um who, who are the department who actually moves the legislation um because what they've done is uh, instead of having to bring forward new legislation which would require a full parliamentary procedure yeah they're using what's called a statutory instrument mm. which is basically a way of making a relatively straightforward change to the law with the minimum amount of bureaucracy parliamentary bureaucracy effectively what's happened this week is that the um the amendment and the interpretive notes that go with it the, the order that goes with it the implement uh, which, which discusses implementation mm -hmm. background and implementation um has been published it's been placed before the house of lords and the house of commons and it only requires a single vote in each each chamber if it mm -hmm. passes the laws amended it's, yeah. it's a very simple it's a very simple straightforward process if it passes in parliament there's then an implementation period and on current timetable the entire thing should be in place and operational certainly by the beginning of next year 2024 yeah yeah so as it will come in, into law at some point in the future most likely yeah yes exactly um yeah and so and again just for the sake of clarity there uh a typical an actual uh, new law uh, would require going back and forth between the houses, being refined, right. having notes and debates and discussion. And That's I think right. I said to you before before we started recording today that the what uh, one could think of a statutory in instrument as being a tool that is used when the law or the amendment or the the, the thing that they're that they're tweaking is relatively uncontroversial. Um, That's right. So, for example, you wouldn't do this when it came to citizenship rights, or when it came to, um, uh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, medical intervention laws, this kind of thing. So, it's stuff that the big yeah. stuff requires back and forth and a lot more um, um, scrutiny. Um, but yeah. you said this was clever. How, how? In what way is this clever? Then, well, it, it simply takes something that was uh, or has been pretty controversial the relationship mm. between archaeology professional archaeology and metal detecting mm. where there is a strong in metal detecting in particular there is a strong you you, you talked about the you know it's mine i found it mm. i went no no again there aren't many metal detectors who would in public say that was the case no but there is a strong libertarian argument uh, among metal detectors that it you know our hobby is legal and therefore it should be as restricted as little as possible yeah yeah um what this does it 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 makes a uh it makes a change to the definition of treasure um which could restrict the mm -hmm. hobby if it develops in a particular way and i'll talk about that later um but it does it in a way that is very simple and straightforward and um in, in parliamentary terms uh you know relatively uncontroversial uh, yes. it, you know it, it changes one aspect of the treasure app, which is the definition of treasure mm. Mm. um and so it's a way of really short-circuiting any major controversy and debate mm -hmm. every the idea being that everybody has had an opportunity to um, respond to the consultation and therefore this is now the synthesis of the consultation yes yeah and 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 uh, and therefore democ there isn't a democratic deficit because everyone's had their input so if there is this new focus on the cultural value of the material and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be precious metal content uh yeah. 
could this now cover a um uh, a, a flint scatter or a uh or you know a plow shirt a plow uh, blade not shirt um you know it, how how wide is this net net now being cast away from a gold and silver in that sense for some archaeologists that's the problem right. because it doesn't cast it very far away from gold and silver it for example it doesn't talk apart it, you know, it still relies on metal content it doesn't talk about for example ceramics or mm -hmm. flints or anything else no um what it does do is change the definitions of uh, objects with metal content mm -hmm. um, so that uh, essentially the um, any metal object more than 200 years old is potentially caught up um, in the act okay well it, it, it essentially it add it, it adds a bit of range to the 96 act and so for example, under the new definition of treasure, mm -hmm. um, an article is classed as treasure if it is a rare example of its of its type. And I'm quoting from the uh, from the, um, the statutory instrument here. A rare um, its rarity is an example of its type uh, found in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. The location, regional part of the United Kingdom in which it's found or its connection with a particular person or event, or if it doesn't on its own provide such insight, it is when found as part of the same find as one or more other objects that provide such an insight when taken together with those objects. In other words, you know, if you find um, Julius C the remains of Julius Caesar's lunch, um, and including his, his knife, in a pot mm -hmm. uh, on the beach at Deal, where the Roman army came ashore, that would be a big deal. Um, right. It would be a very big deal, right. and it would be covered by, and it would be covered by the Treasure Act because it would provide insight to a major historical event and a major right. person and a major historical personage. Of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, making, I'm citing a ridiculous example there, but, but that's how it. But, that's the idea of how it would work. But the way in, though, is metal still. Yes, the way in is metal. Right, I see. I see. Uh, yeah. So, so, and, and thinking about it, I mean, if it's more than two hundred years old, we're talking about regency, aren't we? So it starts in. Yeah, well, the the, the, expl the explanatory notes talk about things, for example, like uh, significant elements of industrial history and mm. um, the industrial revolution would now be potentially covered okay. as being significant. You know, okay. I mean, that um, is interesting. But but a bit, yeah. but a big, I mean, again, because I'm I'm also partly. Uh, I can't quite shake the prehistorian habit. Um, in, that, no. in that sense, the um, uh, because the way in is metal, that also that basically discounts more or less everything prior to the Bronze Age, really. Uh, also, which is what, which is why a lot of which is why a lot of archaeologists um, mm. criticise this as a as, as a basis. Of, they, they, you know, there are many archaeologists, and I, I, I'd be included in this, who would rather see legislation that was based on. Uh, you know, historical and archaeological value, regardless of materiality. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, we're not, that this is not where we are. Where, where we are is a simple amendment to existing legislation rather than, you know, um, we, you know having to start with an entirely new, effectively legislative regime. Because mm. if we move to a regime that was based on just on purely on significance, that would require major thought consultation and although it might be archaeologically right, it will be much more difficult to do. Time-consuming, costly. Yeah. yeah. A watching brief is a formal program of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst, and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared, and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. Who, thou, in this broader definition of treasure, uh, and the potential to bring in, for example, Julius Caesar's lunch and pot, and pottery along with a knife or a base metal coin this kind of thing <clears throat> um who gets to, who who initially decides on that value 
So if it's valuable, for example, again, we were talking about this before we started recording, something that's valuable here in the northeast of England might be very common in the south of England based on yeah. historical factors that, that you know, economic and social connections and so on and so forth. You could go, oh, my goodness, this, this yeah. is a really good example of X in the northeast, but in the south, yeah. they, they, they turn up all the time. So who, who actually decides what is significant? Right. This is where it gets complicated and the loopholes some people would argue start to open up oh, okay because the legislation doesn't say oh. um and really neither does the interpretive uh, the interpretive document the order hmm. um the expectation i think is that um metal detectorists themselves are the point where the decision's first made as to whether something's significant or not. And many metal detectorists have a good deal of, you know, a body of knowledge about the things that they find. Or if they don't themselves, then they're part of networks that do either physical networks of, you know, friends, colleagues, fellow club members, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, places where they can ask for advice. You know, I found this, uh, do you know what it is? Mm. Oh, that looks interesting. Better show it to the FLO. Yeah. 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 That's the expectation. Yeah. Um, some people might argue that that is perhaps a less than robust way of framing a piece of legislation, you know, well, the, the, the outcome of a piece of legislation. Well, do you know, we were handed a, a really interesting example of that moment in uh, the Christmas special of the detectorists, were we not? Mm. Where you have these two men, uh, right at the beginning, you have what's his name saying, um, uh, toby jones's character saying you know i'm i want metal i'm interested in metal and they completely mm. discount this uh this cup that this clay vessel that may well have been the grail itself <laughs> yes um you know spoilers for for a couple of months old tv uh, tv episode there but yeah. it, that's interesting isn't it so that that if if someone came across the grail would 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 uh but then again actually that wouldn't fall in with this definition of treasure anyway wouldn't it because it wasn't found it wouldn't have been found in that instance with metal or with a coin yeah. or for example okay you're right yeah yeah um, sticky it, it, yeah it is mm. um and the um again i i don't know we don't know mm. but it for example it is possible that because there's a legal sanction potentially involved if you don't report something that's significant defined as treasure mm. that this will drive detectorists to report things to the portable antiquities scheme more for fear that they might be caught down the line uh with with, a, with an item of treasure that they haven't declared okay yeah it's what it's what in the um in government is called nudge theory mm. It's where you create an environment which guides people's behaviour without actually having to legislate to guide that behaviour. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, and so that is one possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, another possibility is that, for example, um, artifacts like that Hansen's auction where the Iron Age harness mount turned up that the pas british museum will just do more formally what we know they already do mm -hmm. which is monitor things like auctions and evil bay and you know other uh, online sales uh, platforms are available i got a really you know. good microphone off ebay a couple of days ago so you know it, it... <laughs> i'm not knocking it i'm not knocking it most of the time it's perfectly legal except for the stuff that isn't yeah. um so uh yeah so yeah there, 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 are, there are possibilities within possibilities of, of this and what this is designed to do effectively what it does is give the the regulators like Historic England and the uh, bodies that are involved in this, like the Portable Antiquities Scheme, another tool uh, to attract uh, more declarations, mm -hmm. obtain more knowledge, and um, perhaps as well control um, more the, the the people who might be um, tempted to act either 
illegally or just you know not declare stuff because they want to hang on to it yeah is it i'm not sure if it's worth speculating on this but i'm curious in so much as is a potential side effect of this sort of move uh assuming it goes through and gets its two votes um that 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 your auction houses won't keep on keep on picking on charlie hansen you know there are others out there um yes. that your auction houses will start to uh in the past when we talked about about this 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 trade one of the things that really stood out to me and stands out to me still is listings on auction um websites where they talk about for example iron age horse regalia uh, and yeah. they and they just blast you with text, you know, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, you know, not particularly often very well formatted. Just, you know, this must be valuable because look, there's hundreds of words here, thousands of words here. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a potential there? And, and I think at the time I, I described it as being historiosity in, in, in to the extent that it adds to the value of the auction or, or the potential, you know, a yield. Mm -hmm. um that therefore stuff that is pre-bronze age i.e stuff that is less likely to be found with metal will just mm -hmm. have its historiosity upped um in order to create that value within these markets now I, i'm not i don't mean to give people ideas here but it's it's interesting how uh the, the, yeah i mean I, I suppose to put it another way um this really hasn't gone that far has it it hasn't really um curtailed or stepped on too many people's toes it's just it's, it's tweaked things and i guess that's the whole point is it? it's not a new law it's it's a it's a, a modification i i think it's useful at this point and and i absolutely taking your point there on board i think it's useful mm. at this point to step back and look at the politics of this yeah um you know, first of all what the what historic england port of antiquities scheme and the dcms appear to have done is go for a quick and easy win Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. too much, uh, they can get that they can get this onto the statute book. Please, at one level, quite a few archaeologists by at least appearing to, or actually, no, not appearing to, actually tightening up yeah. on the classification of treasure. So hopefully, we won't see another Rydale or another Crosby Garrett, mm -hmm. right? Um, but if you step back from it a little bit further. Um, there's been a very interesting response from the National Council for Metal Detecting uh, that was released today, uh, it, and it's their response to the um, to the amendment order. Um, now, and, and the background to this is the NCMD is famously um, robust, shall we say, in defending the rights of individual metal detectors to undertake their hobby yeah. without with a minimum of regulation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. One of the issues is that under British law, English law, definitions famously change and morph and develop as they're used by lawyers and cases are decided by judges. Yeah, yeah. So it is potentially possible for the definition of significance to be developed and nuanced and changed and even expanded in practice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and all, all you need is a judge to sort of intellectually make the connection between Caesar's lunch and the tile next to it, for example. Yeah. And it, it starts to expand, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And what the NCMD have told their members is, um, quote, if this new significance classification starts to go beyond the stated intention of producing only really important national, uh, of, of protecting only really important national and regional fines, then we are fully prepared to step in and fund the cost of legal challenges. Right. Saying that, we trust and hope this will not be necessary. Hmm. So they're fully aware that um, they could be on the top of a slope that leads down to certainly tighter definitions of what they uh what they can hang on to and what is held to be significant and therefore treasure mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah so in 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 that respect because actually this is a good piece of legislation mm. because it's it you know if the people who are finding the stuff that is most targeted think are thinking it could actually you know develop um and and lead to more stuff being declared significant and being 
you know, taken in by museums, the BM, PAS, then that's a good thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for the greater public good. Mm. Um, the greater but there's good. another comment they made. The greater good, Not that's both. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is another comment that the National Council for Detecting make. Um, and they talk about issues around uh, the capability of the portable antiquity scheme, for example, in particular, to handle an increased caseload mm. um, when um, the um, the system is already famously quite slow. Now, in fact, the, um, the, the, the new code introduces target times. The DCMS have introduced target times for processing yeah. fines and treasure fines in particular. Mm. Um, but... Yeah, those are those those are those are targets. Um, more or less a set of guidelines. Like, you know, um, it's it, it, tar- targets can be missed, as we know from the health service. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I think there's one final thing though to consider, which uh, the National Council on Metal Detecting say in their guidance notes. Now, it it might alarm some archaeologists looking at this. Mm-hmm. What they say is that we have been, this is a direct quote, we have been repeatedly assured by the DCMS, Department for Cultural Media and Sport, that items being considered under this new classification of treasure will have to meet a very high bar of evidence, and that is unlikely to bring in a large number of new treasure cases, brackets, less than 100 a year. In other words, and and that language about high bars is repeated in the guidance notes that come with the statutory instrument Mm -hmm. um and it uh, also quotes the what are called the waverley criteria for um significance of cultural objects which are used in assessing export licenses and whether something is going to be barred from being given an export license to give for example museums or art galleries a chance to buy a significant object or painting Mm -hmm. that is destined for export Mm -hmm. um and yeah the uh, their significance is has to be at a pretty high level archaeologists might think that a, an amendment that brings less than 100 cases a year what's the point hmm hmm <laughs> and yet though undeniably it's definitely making a change um, yes. Elsewise, why, you know, why would, uh, why would in in their in their um, response document, would the uh, National Council for Metal, De- Metal Detecting feel the need to point that out? In so much as it's it's a that that's a, um, yeah, that that's trying to sort of sm- yeah, make the impact seem as small as possible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and look, I acknowledge I, I am being a little bit unfair there because yeah. obviously, you know, we we don't want another Crosby Garrett, we don't want another Rydale Horde no. as archaeologists, and the, this amendment should provide a mechanism to prevent that. Mm. But in terms of the way it's implemented, in terms of particularly who judges significance and when in the process that judgment's made, mm. I think there are a lot of questions here still, um, mm. and it's certainly I think. I, <laughs> I will categorise what we're seeing here as necessary and welcome work in progress. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if if this is seen as an endpoint, I think there is still a problem in the relationship between archaeology and and, and particularly metal detecting. So, one final question uh, in this to and fro and back and forth in terms of the considerations and, and all the stuff that surrounds this uh this tweak of legislation um what does uh michael lewis have to say about it uh, he is the head of the port of antiquity scheme but also the head of that yeah. scheme at a time when there are uncomfortable questions surrounding particular events at a certain pas office and material having seemingly gone missing um uh, and the, and the effect that that's had on the metal detecting community surrounding that 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 instance, i.e., a matter of trust. Uh, you, I mean, you said earlier that that potentially people were after a, an easy win, uh, a quick, relatively quick win, in terms of um, using this instrument instead of passing a full new law through the houses of of, of parliament. Um, 
is is this is there a possibility that 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 that's the case here actually that this helps strengthen the function of the PAS and can be seen as a as a, a reforming um solidifying move in the context of what was well we yet to see the outcome but what initially was quite an embarrassing moment uh in recent months yeah i mean obviously we can't comment on an ongoing police no. investigation uh and i've no, uh, enough you know i'm not going to mm -hmm. um what professor lewis does say uh, in, in connection with the, the current publication um is first of all um that uh he hopes that the particularly the the, the practice notes um the way uh, the code of practice for metal detecting and the uh, and, and the way that the PAS responds to metal detecting fines will be seen as a uh, a major improvement mm -hmm. on what went before uh, and responding to you know concerns within the various stakeholders. Um, he uh, also acknowledges uh, in a number of tweets that the threshold for significance will be high. I'm quoting here from a a tweet uh, that he put out um, so that, quote, a, a relatively small number of fines each year, end quote, will be affected and, quote, museums will need to wish to acquire them, end quote. Mm. Um, he also says that, uh, quote, I think in most cases detectorists will be quite sure they found something amazing and that sh it should be in a museum and will probably be thankful for process that sorts that out, i.e. ensure it ends up in a museum and that they are fairly rewarded brackets assuming they want the money end right. quote uh end brackets end quote mm. so you know um it, what he seems to be saying there is, is acknowledging that it's a significant change in terms of practice um and particularly practice within the pas and the uh, the treasure process um but that actually the impact in broader terms won't be that great now there'll be archaeologists who welcome that There'll be other archaeologists who think that's not going nearly far enough. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, I don't, and in, and in I, that sense, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily worthwhile saying where we are on that. Is it? In so much as I think, I think what we've been doing here is just, is just presenting this conversation. Um, yes. But acknowledging the fact that there will be people who who who, who are disappointed um, uh, is worthwhile doing. Um, okay. So so. Do you think this will go into law? I suppose that's the other thing as well. I mean, at the moment, we're not, you know, it hasn't been voted up, voted on. Is it likely to get through? Do you think? Um, unless somebody, and it will be more likely to come from metal detecting world than archaeology world, um, unless somebody brings forward a major lobbying campaign and um, attempts at judicial review and whatever mm -hmm. um i think it is uh more likely m much more likely than not to be uh, uh, uh to be passed and, and and enter law uh, i don't think this would have been brought forward if they hadn't rolled the pitch in terms yeah. of uh, it'll go through yeah so um yeah i think we, we I, I think we're looking at the amendment becoming um operational by the beginning of next year 2024 interesting so uh that's been a watching brief we we said we'd try and make talking about the amendment of legislation as interesting as possible and hopefully we've achieved it for at least one of our viewers at uh, home uh, <laughs> um uh, i suppose it occurs to me actually that that our our little uh investigation our our f fascinating story with regards to that illegal burial case actually may not be coming next week because tomorrow as we're recording is the one year anniversary of the beginning of russia's war in ukraine um so i think next week we're likely to be talking about about that aren't we we'll probably get some guests in and um and reflect a little bit on it i suppose is there anything that that's likely to is there anything more that we know about that about that conflict and its effect on uh culture history heritage and the people living there that 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 will come into play in the next year do you think i mean just just as a as a, as a, a direction of travel for next week's conversation only that the the longer the conflict in ukraine goes on the more reports there are of 
um, not just uh, war crimes, mm. uh, which are obviously the, the, the most serious, but um, cultural war crimes too, mm. you know, from the destruction of cultural sites to the looting of museums and the uh, illegal export of artifacts uh, to the Russian Federation. Um, so sadly, depressingly, um, mm. yeah, I think we're going to be we, we're going to be seeing more of the same. We'll, 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 we'll try and take a make an assessment of that. I think probably next week's show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, for my part, I think something that I've noticed increasingly over the course of the past year uh, has been actually how uh, it's been broader art interest groups in our art, art newspapers. I think literally the art newspaper um, mm. has been at the forefront of, of at the very least um, presenting claims. It's one of those things where when you, when you put this in front of um, people like, for example, Paul Barford, you know, he, he's very mm. slow to, to jump on the, the, you know, he, he, He's much more sober and careful about it, which is reasonable, mm. very reasonable in the case of of, uh, of conflict zones. But it's also interesting, yeah, to see to see who has been taking a lead on reporting of these potential stuff. But anyway, but that's that's for next week. So it seems that that story that that I'm kind of itching to tell uh, <laughs> about an interesting burial may have to wait a couple of weeks. Uh, or if something else turns up on our agenda, as it often seems to do, uh, we may just do a, a special or one-off special recording for it. You know, it could be interesting. Um, All I would say about that, Mark, is, is that the, um, the, 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 the anticipation might make it all the more delightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Okay, guys. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for your time as ever, Andy. And uh, I'm going to let you go and walk your dog. It sounds like he's eager to go out and uh, see the world. Uh, until next time, do take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.